new ship sails into Sydney Harbour on her maiden voyage around the globe. The P&O Line's latest flagship, Oriana, is the product of 150 years' development of passenger ships. For most of their history, there was no machine either on land, sea or in the air to match them in size, power and range. And like rockets of the space age, they were pinnacles of human achievement, representing industrial and technological might. Ships from the very beginning are symbolic of nations and peoples. It's showing the flag, your ship is bigger than their ship, and so you have this constant race for size. So these are tremendous national symbols, they capture the imagination. Capitalists, kings and kaisers all became embroiled in an extraordinary game of one-upmanship to build faster, larger and more opulent liners. But the race for profits and prestige often ended in tragedy and controversy. Many people felt that the sinking of the Titanic going down on its maiden trip was actually the beginning of the end, the slow decline of the British Empire. The rivalry between nations that spawned the building of the great liners ultimately led to conflict. And they were to become giant pawns in the battle for dominance of the globe. The sinking of the Lusitania was one of the first cases of modern total war. With their massive people-carrying capacity, the liners were to help push the boundaries of war to a global scale. The story of the ocean liner is an epic saga of one of the great icons of the industrial age. The largest moving object ever built, which shrank the world and became the vehicle of enormous social and political change. It was once thought that the jet airliner would spell doom for passenger ships. But today there are far more people travelling the oceans of the world than ever before. Extraordinary floating cities of up to 100,000 tonnes now routinely voyage to the four corners of the globe, carrying thousands of passengers and crew. Behind the romance conjured by these great ships, there is a long and dramatic evolution. A story of visionaries and rival nations who pushed human ingenuity and technology to their limits in a great race for dominance of the sea. Throughout the 18th century, Britain ruled the waves. With frail vessels of timber and canvas, she built and held together the greatest empire the world had seen. But her vital communication links with her colonies were totally dependent on the vagaries of wind and current. Before the opening of the Suez Canal, you had to go around the Cape to get out to the Far East and out to Australia. With sailing vessels, you're talking of five to eight months for round trips. In the days of sail, passengers were often regarded as cargo. Their comfort and safety of less consequence to ship owners than their profitability. And in the old pre-steam days, when you used to have sailing brigs, they were called coffin brigs. 
because they often never got there. In a thousand years, the evolution of ships had been painfully slow. But as the 18th century turned, that was all to change. By the 1820s, the driving force of the Industrial Revolution, steam, was successfully being adapted to ships. The first steamships were modest affairs, small coal-burning paddle wheelers plying the coasts and rivers of Europe and North America. But crossing the Atlantic Ocean in a steamship was thought to be impossible. Indeed, one skeptic considered it as achievable as voyaging from Liverpool to the moon. But in 1819, a converted New York sailing packet, the Savannah, made the crossing in 27 and a half days, beginning a new chapter in maritime history. And there were other oceans to conquer. In 1829, Sophia Jane became the first ship ever to paddle sail halfway around the world from London to Sydney, Australia. In 20 remarkable years, steamships had come of age, inspiring a new breed of ship owners and designers. In 1837, Arthur Anderson and Brodie Wilcox, the founders of the P&O line, pioneered a Royal Mail service between England and Spain with a small fleet of steamers. Three years later, Samuel Cunard began the first scheduled mail service across the North Atlantic with Britannia. A mail subsidy from the British government had paid for the ship, passengers provided the profit. And I took the trouble to read Cunard's mail contract, and passengers aren't mentioned in it anywhere. But they followed in his wake because his ships arrived safely. By the late 1830s, steamships, with their promise of faster, more reliable passage, began to challenge sail for passenger trade to all corners of the globe. But the ships were small, and demand quickly exceeded the berths available. In the late 1830s, the visionary British engineer Isambard Kingdom Brunel came up with a bold concept a large high-speed liner specifically built for a transatlantic passenger service. Brunel's timber-hulled Great Western, launched in Bristol in 1837, was one of the biggest ships of her time, carrying up to 150 passengers. But it was Brunel's second creation, the Great Britain, which ushered in a new age, the era of the ocean liner. Brunel took a steam engine and the newly invented screw propeller and fitted them into an iron hull, creating the first truly ocean-going passenger liner. She made 32 round trips from Britain to Australia, making her by far the most travelled steamship of her time. The Great Britain could accommodate up to 360 passengers, her most famous, the first English cricket team to visit Australia in 1861. Newspapers of the day reported with great enthusiasm on the laying of over 1,000 yards of best quality carpet and the installation of mirrors to increase the impression of space. Part of the reasoning was to take people's minds away from the dangers in crossing the ocean at that early date, before wireless, uh, before all of the fine points of naval architecture and stability were taken into account, as well as to help people take their mind off of seasickness and the inevitable pitching and rolling that uh, came about, particularly on the North Atlantic. The Great Britain survives today restored in the Bristol dry dock where she was constructed over a century and a half ago.
really it was the wonder of the age. It was the largest ship in the world. He laid the whole foundation for the modern ocean liner in that one design. Ah, Mr. Brunel, what are you designing now? Something we shall find amusing, I trust. How about something six times bigger than anything like it before? Oh, Isambard. On a muddy bend of the River Thames in February 1854, 2,000 workers began construction on Brunel's ocean-going colossus, the Great Eastern. A vessel capable of steaming from England to Australia without recoaling, and in less than half the time of a sailing ship. A ship that could carry 4,000 passengers in peace, or 10,000 troops in war. Surely this would be the culmination of Britain's conquest of the sea. Uh, an incredible ship with paddle wheels, with five funnels, with a single screw propeller, uh, and with a record of catastrophe and disaster that cannot be equaled. She never made it from the day that she was launched into the Thames sideways and stuck and wouldn't move for weeks and months from the day that she uh, hit a storm off the south coast of Ireland, they predicted that she'd never have a rough time because her length was such that it was exceed the longest trough between waves ever recorded on the North Atlantic. Uh, never underestimate the power of the Atlantic. They, they took the passengers' luggage off in, in scoops. It was just a slurry in the, in the baggage hold. Uh, and and the, this great ship tossing about like a cork. The Great Eastern never made a single voyage to Australia. Beset with financial problems during construction, she was sold, and her new owners placed her on the shorter Atlantic run to New York, where competition was soaring. Her 4,000 berths were never filled. With enormous manpower and fuel costs, she was a financial disaster. Finally, after several accidents, Great Eastern was sold again, her final days spent laying submarine cables across the Atlantic and Indian Oceans. Finally, before she was scrapped, she ended up as a sort of floating hoarding uh, at Liverpool. They covered her sides with posters. Very ignominious end. Brunel's dream was never realized, but his vision of giant ocean liners encircling the globe unaided and providing the ultimate in comfort for thousands of passengers was merely ahead of its time. Today, great diesel-driven propellers churn the oceans of the world. On ships like the 70,000-ton Oriana, every aspect of life on board revolves around the comfort of passengers. But it's a far cry from the early days of steam. In the mid-19th century, a voyage on a p and steamer from Britain to a diplomatic posting in India, or beyond to the gold fields of Australia, was a long, tedious affair. Until 1869, a traveller had two choices. Sail all the way round the Cape, or take a ship to Alexandria and cross to Suez by camel, and then pick up another ship. Whichever way, the only relief from the monotony of shipboard routine was the hopeful conviviality of one's fellow passengers. Without air conditioning and refrigeration, passengers would sit to windward, hoping to escape belching smoke or the smells and noises from the animal pens and the slaughterhouse. The opening of the Suez Canal in 1869 dramatically cut the steaming time from Europe to the east. But the Suez Canal nearly destroyed p &O. A generous subsidy from the British government had been tied to transporting the mails overland. To keep the much-needed subsidy, 
the line was forced to unload the mails at one end, dispatch them by rail and reload them at the other end. A slow and ludicrous process. This is all a part of the history that I was taught when I was a young boy. And it's a part of me, the fact that when the canal first came along, um, it almost broke the company's back. But having renegotiated the contract, it was then the saving of the company because we had ships that used to then be much faster to take the mail through. Constructed by Frenchman Ferdinand de Lesseps, Britain initially feared the Suez Canal would give other maritime nations access to the riches of the East, particularly the French who controlled the canal. The British government was so concerned, it purchased a major shareholding in the Suez Canal Company in 1876, and the vital gateway to the East was secured. Rather than threaten Britain's power, the Suez Canal was to strengthen it. A journey from Britain to India that once took up to two months by sailing ship was now reduced to a matter of weeks by steamer. The world was indeed shrinking. India. Her teeming people and the wealth they created for Britain made her, a century ago, the jewel in the imperial crown. Today, P&O's ships bring tourists instead of colonial administrators. But in the days when Queen Victoria ruled supreme, ocean liners provided the vital communication and transport links with England. They were apostles of the British way of life, enormous symbols of her technological might and fundamental to her hold over her empire. An empire on which the sun never set. There was a pride associated with the conquest of the seas, the command of the seas, and we were by far the dominant naval power militarily and in merchant terms, and there was a great determination that that would not be diminished. Britain may have dominated the oceans of the world, but by the 1870s, Steamships flying the flags of almost every maritime nation were operating regular passenger services around the globe. And the competition encouraged great breakthroughs in design, technology and passenger comfort. As the final vestiges of sail gave way to more powerful steam engines, the travelling public began to equate the number of funnels rather than masts with power and speed of passage. It was the Atlantic run to New York where the big profits lay and where an extraordinary race began to own the fastest liners. A race called the Blue Ribbon of the Atlantic. There's always been a chap who thought he could do better and in the old days it was doing faster. On the North Atlantic, speed was everything. Well, to the home office it meant more passengers. There was no greater thrill for the passenger to write home on a postcard regards from the world's fastest ship. From the earliest days of steam, British lines dominated the Blue Ribbon. On the busiest sea route in the world, their liners had become potent symbols of Britain's seemingly unassailable maritime might. Less than 20 years after the birth of the new united German nation, Kaiser Wilhelm II embarked on a deliberate course to build an empire to rival Britain. To achieve his aim, he hoped to match his English cousins where they were strongest, on the oceans of the world. The Kaiser had been to the Fleet Review in 1889 and was very impressed with these British ships, envious. And it was, of course, his old grandmother, Queen Victoria. And he went back to Germany. He said, we've got to have these big ships. Imperial Germany must dominate. Remembering, of course, that at this point, the ocean liner is the supreme mechanical symbol. 
With the Kaiser's encouragement, North German Lloyd set about building a series of passenger ships to shake the world. The Kaiser Wilhelm de Grosse, launched in 1897, was the first in a series of four liners over 14,000 tons. Their four funnels set a new benchmark in design, and their luxurious interiors were unparalleled on the high seas. On her maiden voyage, Kaiser Wilhelm de Grosse powered across the Atlantic to New York, snatching the blue ribbon from her Cunard rivals. In one spectacular crossing, Germany established itself as a major maritime power. For the first time, the Germans had the biggest, the most luxurious and the fastest ship in the world. And it was built in Germany for a German company. And these five points never before were in united in one ship. Just shook the English literally out of their seats. How could they come along with a ship this big? And worse still, she's captured the blue ribbon. To suddenly have an upstart, a place which hadn't even been a country, get together and build four stackers. This was a shock to England, a terrible blow, and they had to do something about it. Almost immediately, a furious game of one-upmanship began between Britain and Germany. Within the year, White Star Line commissioned Belfast shipbuilders Harland and Wolfe to build a new flagship, the Oceanic. She was to be 20% larger than her German rival and, at 685 feet, the first ocean liner to exceed the length of Brunel's visionary Great Eastern. Even the German Kaiser was impressed by the ship's beauty, calling her a marvel of perfection in building and fittings. Two years later, in 1901, White Star launched the Celtic, an even bigger liner. But at 21,000 tons, she was designed for comfort rather than speed. Germany's hold on the Blue Ribbon would remain unchallenged. They were soldiers of the Queen no longer. Even a century must reach its end even a queen who had reigned for 63 years. Don in the black and beat the drums, for the queen was dead. As the British people mourned the end of Queen Victoria's reign, the deep-seated rivalry between Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany and his uncle, Edward, the new King of England, entered a new, unbridled phase. As well as a strong merchant fleet, Germany was building up her naval strength. A move which greatly concerned the British Admiralty. The next challenge to Britain's dominance of the sea, however, didn't come from the German Navy, but American money. J.P. Morgan, the railroad tycoon, wanted to expand his railway empire right across the Atlantic. And more importantly, monopolized the entire transatlantic liner trade. He bought the Red Star Line, he bought the White Star Line, which was one of the cornerstones of England's maritime supremacy. And the British were distressed that in the event of war, they would not be able to take over the White Star Line ships because they weren't British owned anymore. At the Cunard Line's Liverpool head office, Morgan's audacity caused a sensation. He wanted to take them over as well. At an emergency board meeting, Cunard decided to lobby the government by playing on the Admiralty's concerns of a German challenge. The strategy worked brilliantly. The government not only agreed to prevent the takeover, but to help finance the two biggest ships ever constructed. So they voted a subsidy to help Cunard build the first ships that were ever called superliners. Cunard secured a generous subsidy and a two and a half million pound loan from the government to build two giant ships, Mauritania and Lusitania. At nearly 32,000 tons each, 
They were the largest and fastest ships in the world. Both were to win the blue ribbon of the Atlantic. The government supported Cunard not merely to regain British pride. While built for peace, these two express liners were designed for war. They were powered by enormous turbine engines and their decks reinforced to take 12 six-inch guns. In these two superliners, Britain had also two high-speed auxiliary cruisers to add to its navy in a potential war with Germany. A war already brewing in the minds of military strategists on both sides. And there was certainly quite a minority voice in the House of Commons that wasn't terribly happy at the use of public money for really subsidising a private company. Um, but on the, on the plus side was the clear understanding that those two ships in time of war would be used as auxiliary cruisers. Cunard, however, was far more interested in profits than war. And from the titled rich to the poorest immigrants, the traveling public loved the four-funneled Cunarders. First-class voyagers preferred the distinction, the cachet of sailing in such enormous vessels. In 1907, the year the liners went into service, more than a million immigrants purchased steerage tickets to America. It was the greatest wave of migration the world had seen, and there were huge profits to be made for the most popular ships. With two blue ribbon holders, Cunard now offered the smoothest and fastest passage across the Atlantic and quickly captured the lion's share of the immigrant trade. The ships were enormously successful, as the fastest ship is always successful. On the Atlantic in those days, whoever could make a, a crossing in a few hours less time than the rival uh, got the cream of the business. British prestige and morale and power was restored. British shipbuilding was now at its zenith. In all categories of size, speed and technology, they had met their German rivals and won, albeit with a little help from the government. Shipbuilding towns and the lives of the workers and their families had always been bound up in the fortunes of the yard. And as far as they and their employers were concerned, competition was good for business. A great technological race, the most serious in maritime history, was about to begin. With Cunard's new ships stealing all the glory, Bruce Ismay, the chairman of White Star Line, decided to beat Cunard at its own game. Not with two, but three giant liners. And with J.P. Morgan's money, Ismay didn't have to go cap in hand to any government. But Ismay decided, I'm going to have the best ships ever. I want the biggest, grandest ships that anyone ever had. I want to be the best. At Harland and Wolf's Belfast Yard in mid-December 1908, the largest army of ship workers ever assembled began construction of not one, but two giant hulls side by side. Their names, the Olympic and the Titanic. A third ship, gigantic, would follow. Olympic led the way. Titanic mirrored her progress three months behind. The entire project created enormous international interest, especially from rival yards. Intriguingly, the entire construction was documented by German cameramen. At more than 45,000 tons and 850 feet in length, the two White Star giants were one and a half times the size of their Cunard rivals, Mauritania and Lusitania. With the Olympic billed as the largest ship in the world, 
White Star needed a new publicity slogan for the slightly larger Titanic. Titanic, they proclaimed, was virtually unsinkable, the largest and safest liner in the world. She was the last word in luxury. Money really was no object on the interior fitting of the ship. She was designed to do exactly uh, as Esme wanted to be, to be a floating palace. To be the very last word in, in ship design, innovation and in technology and an outfit. For a fleeting moment, Ismay's dream had become a reality. But even he could never have imagined the impact the Titanic would have on her time and history. Not for her size or her grandeur, but for the tragedy that was about to unfold. A tragedy that would touch the lives of so many people, even in the remotest corners of the globe. One hundred kilometers to the northeast of Beirut, perched high on a mountain top, lies the Lebanese village of Kafamishki. For centuries, the people here lived as virtual serfs under the harsh rule of the Ottoman Empire. Poverty and threatening famine made life all the more difficult. Those days are now long gone, but live on in the memory of the village's oldest resident, 110-year-old Elias Elsikli. He recalls as a boy the talk in the town of a new world across the sea, a place that offered hope for a better life. From as early as I can remember, about a hundred years ago, people would leave the village they traveled in order to earn more money and build their future. You see, this land was not ours. So when a chance came, we took it. In 1911, Elias and a group of other villagers decided to migrate to Canada. But with preparations well underway, Elias became engaged to a local girl who wouldn't leave her family. Elias farewelled the party as they set out on their five-day journey by donkey to Beirut. From there to the French port of Cherbourg to wait with other migrants from all over Europe for a ship to the New World. In the port building, the group struggled to be understood. Without proper documentation, their names weren't recorded correctly on the passenger list. The vessel they boarded, by chance, was no ordinary ship. She was Titanic. The world's largest ocean liner on her maiden voyage from Southampton, with one last port of call before setting out across the Atlantic to New York. She had been advertised as a, a ship that was practically unsinkable. For some reason, uh, many people have forgotten the word practically. But anything that's big enough and heavy enough with a hole in it that's full of water will sink. Half the souls on board. The, the awful thing about Titanic and the old ships was that the first class country was amidships and up high. And that's where all the lifeboats were. The steerage passengers were in the hull, forward and aft, and lifeboats were not within their ken. It's locked! It's locked! There's no way out here! Go back! So when the disaster came, they didn't know where to go. They, they had no idea of the geography, and there were still stewards on the Titanic as the ship was starting to go down who were trying to keep the barriers up and keep the steerage passengers out of first-class country. It was classically a case of first class went first and second class went second and the poor third class had no place at all to go. 
And of course, on top of it, coupled with the fact that the poor Titanic didn't have enough lifeboats anyway, made it all the worse. Two hours after the collision, Titanic sank three and a half kilometers down to her final resting place. The next morning, crowds of New Yorkers converged on the White Star office, eager for news. First reports were confused. One newspaper ran a headline claiming all were saved and that Titanic was taken in tow by another liner. The city of Southampton stopped at the news. One by one, the facts filtered through to a stunned world. Of the 2,207 passengers and crew on board, two-thirds were believed lost, including the captain. One of the survivors, it was announced, was Bruce Ismay, the chairman of White Star. The news of the tragedy took more than three months to reach Kavamishki. Well, I think 13 died, if I'm not wrong, and one survived only. And almost every uh, family in town lost a relative or a friend, and it was very tough on them. Only one woman survived. If she had died, we would never have heard the truth, because our friends were not on the passenger list. Titanic's builders, Harland and Wolf, lost eight of its employees in the disaster, including its chief designer, Thomas Andrews. It was just numbed horror. Guys who had spent their life working on Titanic had seen it grow from, from a simple plate to a, a living creature, if you like, put their heart and soul into it. Couldn't believe it had gone. It, it really it, it brought you up short. Shouldn't you realize just that, that really human beings are fallible and that nothing is permanent. At the official inquiry, Harland and Wolf was exonerated and the quality of its workmanship praised. But the inquiry severely questioned the safety rules of the day dictated by the Board of Trade, especially the provisioning of lifeboats. During the building of the liners, chief designer Thomas Andrews supervised their construction using a single set of plans for both ships. You don't draw the ship twice. You do the drawings for the prototype, which were Olympic. But on the master drawings, he would have changed the drawings using a very thick red ink fountain pen. What he wanted changed for Titanic. Andrews also kept a small notebook in which he meticulously detailed every aspect of the construction. Modifications were made in red, a change to cornices here, to light fittings there. And it's in this small book, forgotten for all these years, that a new detail in the Titanic story comes to light. Harland and Wolfe had designed both ships with not only enough lifeboats to accommodate more than three and a half thousand people, but with spare capacity for a further 65 passengers. But on the adjacent page, the portentous red ink. The lifeboat capacity for the liners had been decimated in the stroke of a pen. But on whose instructions? Lifeboats were seen in those days as uh, necessary evil. They didn't particularly like them because they spoiled the nice look of your ship. So the owner decided the ship would carry the minimum number of lifeboats to have a cleaner line on the ship. The boats wouldn't be stacked three and four deep. And because of that, the spec was changed for the ship and the boats were reduced to the minimum number required under the, the current Board of Trade rules at the time. If there was a positive legacy of the Titanic disaster, it was the effect on safety at sea. The law was changed to ensure a place in a lifeboat for all souls on board, irrespective of class. In 
the loss of the Titanic had an extraordinary effect on British morale. Dozens of memorials were dedicated across Britain to mourn the victims and the end of the public's trust in money, machinery and power. That many people felt that the sinking of the Titanic, a mechanical marvel, unsinkable, going down on its maiden trip, was actually the beginning of the end, the slow decline of the British Empire. So it was a very symbolic act beyond just the ship and White Star and liners. It was a kind of political event in a sense. In times of bad news, people look for distractions. In Britain, there was the motor car. And flying machines. And a new king and queen. But the new king was distracted too. And like his father, the distraction was his royal cousin, Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany. In 1913, King George visits Berlin and rides through the streets with his cousin. The Kaiser's speech is tinged with peaceful platitudes. But behind the scenes, Germany presents a different picture. In the great industrial cauldron of the Ruhr, in the huge foundries of Krupps at Essen, thousands of workers roll gun barrels off the production line. Strength the building for a test of strength. Every gun barrel that rolled off the production line and every ship launched seemed to darken the clouds of war which hung over Europe. And it could only mean to, to one purpose, that was Germany challenging the Royal Navy's hegemony at sea. So it was all fairly clearly coming. The peace-loving director of the Hamburg America Line, Albert Ballen, argued passionately with his friend the Kaiser to let the growing rivalry between Germany and Britain be a duel of the great ships of Cunard and Hamburg America, not ships of war. Only weeks after the shock of the Titanic sinking, the Kaiser launched a new imperial flagship for Ballen's Hamburg America Line, Imperator. She was the first ship ever to exceed 50,000 tons, and her impressive eagle figurehead gave her just enough added length to propel her into the record books as the longest ship ever built. Carrying 4,500 passengers, more than any other liner afloat, the Imperator was the first of a trio of superliners Balin hoped would devastate his Atlantic competition. A year later, in 1913, came Vaterland, larger again, with berths for nearly two and a half thousand immigrants. Both ships reached new heights in ocean-going luxury. Imperator's Pompeian Bath was the most sensational facility of its kind ever to go to sea. The first class passengers were the icing on the cake. They were the ones who had the most beautiful cabins. First class had two-thirds of the ship, but four-fifths of the people who went on the ships were crowded into one-fifth of the space as immigrants. They paid for those great liners. Every year, tens of thousands of people escaping poverty and persecution would arrive in Hamburg from across Europe looking for passage to the New World. Many had heard of Hamburg America's thoughtful treatment of immigrants. Albert Ballen had created a complete village where immigrants could be housed for up to two weeks before sailing. It was fully equipped with a clinic and fumigation center to ensure disease-free passengers. Even the most minor of diseases could result in their rejection in America. As they set off to join their westbound liners, a resident brass band farewelled the travelers. 
In turn, Ballon hoped many a happy immigrant would sing the line's praises to relatives and acquaintances who were to follow. In 1914, Kaiser Wilhelm launched the third and largest member of Ballon's trio of superliners, Bismarck. Conceived in a world at peace, Bismarck was launched into a world only days away from Armageddon. After two decades of tension, Germany and Britain were finally at war a war that would be unprecedented in its violence, destruction and scope. At the outbreak of hostilities, Germany wirelessed all its merchant ships, ordering them to a war footing. Like Britain, Germany had built its liners for rapid conversion to auxiliary cruisers. Indeed, for more than a decade, German liner captains had carried secret orders about what to do in the event of war. In times of peace, uh, the officers and the crew must have been instructed in any way what to do in case of war. In this respect, they did it already 10 years before the war or so, but of, that's only natural and otherwise it's totally senseless to make a large merchant cruiser if in case of emergency nobody knows how to manage it and what to do then. But the early days of the war were a disaster for the Kaiser. Only five liners at sea made it back to Germany to carry out conversion. 37 potential ships of war found themselves impounded in neutral ports. Vaterland was preparing to sail from New York when she received word that French and British cruisers were preparing to intercept her on the Atlantic. Hamburg, America ordered Vaterland to remain in New York and await further instructions. A few days later, she was unofficially impounded by the United States. One of the few German ships converted was the first German Atlantic Blue Ribbon holder, Kaiser Wilhelm de Grosse. After only three weeks in service, a British cruiser cornered her coaling in an African port. Both ships opened fire, but Kaiser Wilhelm de Grosse was mortally wounded. Ironically, the ocean liner that first marked the growing rivalry between Britain and Germany two decades earlier was one of the first casualties of the war. At the beginning of hostilities, the British First Lord of the Admiralty, Winston Churchill, ordered his navy to blockade Germany. Within months, the blockade began to hurt. Food prices skyrocketed, rationing was introduced and strictly enforced. But Germany was prepared. Its fleet of U-boats was ordered to attack British shipping. At first, U-boat captains complied with international rules requiring them to stop and warn ships before sinking them. Then, concerned about arms reaching Britain on neutral ships, the German War Office ordered unrestricted warfare on the high seas. Then Germany declared, it was I think in February 1915, that a zone around the British Islands would be a war zone and every ship met in this zone would be sunk without any warning. Regardless of the U-boat threat, the British government actively encouraged shipping lines to continue regular passenger services across the hostile North Atlantic. One fateful passage in May 1915 was set to become the most controversial incident in maritime history and would push the United States to the brink of war. As the war to end all wars spread across the globe, the fierce rivalry that had spawned the building of the great ocean liners 
would now claim them as prey. From symbols of nations to prime targets. From ships of peace and hope to ships of war and suffering. But in the deadliest game of all, the liners were destined to play a major role in the final outcome.